Okay, good morning, everyone. Um, let me see, we have a post Shavuot syndrome, and not too many uh, are here in the Beit Midrash. Actually, one, we tova now. But the Zat Hashem will learn anyhow and record it. Uh, people can uh, listen to it later. Uh, the Zoom uh, outnumbered three on the Zoom. So. <laughs> yeah. <coughs> okay. Okay, fine. Perfect. Um, <coughs> actually, before we begin, uh, we go we go back go back to our fila. It has to do with what we we we, we had just done last last week uh, in the fila course. Um, we spoke about ve'al gerei hatzedek ve'aleinu. We said that. There's an escalation in the bracha. It goes from lowest to highest. Tzadikim, Hasidim, or in the bracha, v'ala tzadikim v'ala Hasidim. V'al zikne shidem chabet Yisrael, which are the Tamilei Chachamim. Pretat beit sofreim, which are the Gdolei Ador, the uh, singular most uh, knowledgeable and, 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 and uh, greatest poski of the, of the generation. V'al gerei tzedek. So, Seems like the Gerim are at a very, very high level because they came, they joined Am Yisrael from outside. They weren't forced to, they, were, they weren't part of it to begin with, and yet they decided to join, and they're Gerim at Tzedek. They are real, they, they, they are, they're sincere, they, they follow Torah Mitzvahs carefully, so, so they have a, a very high level to them. That's what the Gemara in Kiddushin says, Kashim Gerim li Yisrael kesapachat that uh, converts are difficult for Am Yisrael like, a, like leprosy. So why do we compare them? Why do we say that about them? Toast was there, quote, from Rabbi Ava Mager. So it makes sense that uh, figures that he would say such a thing. He says, Gerim are difficult for, to Am Yisrael because when we compare a Gerim's level to a regular normal Jew, sometimes the Gerim are much more careful to follow Torah mitzvahs and all the halachos because they're new to the thing. So they become like more extreme than those who are regulars and used to it, they do less. So it's, Hashem may see that difference and say, how come you Jews aren't doing the same as this gear, as this uh, convert who came in newly and is very careful of the, to fulfill all Torah mitzvahs properly. So that's why it's a little difficult for us when they're Gary, Gary at Tzedek, because then we compare, Hashem compares us to them, and he, he says, what's going on? Why are you Jews not doing, not on that level, high level like he is? So that's uh, sometimes uh, to some point uh, negative uh, to, for Am Yisrael to have Gary at Tzedek amongst us, but after all, they just, uh, they just, they uh, just, uh, to cause us, they, 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 they challenge us to climb up higher and higher and be like they are uh, as uh, we should be. So I heard something very nice uh, right before Shabbat, before Shavuot, um, in the name of Rav Baruch um, Rosenblum, Rav Baruch Rosenblum, one of the big rabbis now that's uh, becoming more and more famous in his talks and Thousands of people he, listen to him every week. So he says something very nice that Itro, we laid the, for Parshas Itro on Shabbat morning, <clears throat> we laid the Aseris of Dibros for Parshas Itro. So Itro uh, obviously was a convert. He says that to balance a Malik in the world, we have the converts. How does that work? It, a Malik, came and made the, the parable Chazal use is a boiling hot bathtub where no one's willing to go into because it's boiling hot. And some stupid person decides, I'll jump into it. So he calls, he cools off that bathtub because he jumped into it. Maybe he got burnt, but he made it cooler for everyone else to then use, use that bathtub. So Amalek, the same, the same with Amalek. We had them uh, we just had uh, uh, 
came out of Egypt and we had all the tremendous miracles and to create Yamsuf. And so the people, the, the, all the nations around us were scared stiff of us. The Mo Kolish Vichnan, the Pole Mata of Fahad. The description in Az is that everyone trem is trembling, is trembling about Israel. They were afraid because of Hashem doing all these miracles to help us. And yet a Malik came and fought us. So although they lost, like the, the person who jumped into the boiling bathtub got burnt. But after all, they uh, made it, they made the bathtub cooler. Meaning they uh, showed everyone that it's not so terrible to fight us, and we and, they, and then they had more courage to fight us. So that's what it says: "Asher karcha baderich." Karcha, the word kor, kar. They cooled off uh, the uh, boiling bathtub. I mean, the Am Israel being so strong and mighty with Hashem's help, they cooled it off. We could also add to it that they cooled off the Muna within Am Yisrael. Until then, Am Yisrael were, 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 were fire and brimstone with Hashem, and all enthusiastic and excited <coughs> to follow Hashem. And Amale comes and says, there's no Hashem in the world. They deny Hashem, they deny any holy existence. So it cools off it cooled off our excitement to worship Hashem. That's also karcha, made you uh, less excited, less uh, vibrant uh, while worship, to worship Hashem. So Itro, who's uh, the parsha right after Bishalach, which is the parsha, the end of Parsha's Bishalach is where Amalek appears. Right after that, we have Itro. Itro, brought back the, the enthusiasm to worship Hashem. How is that? Because it, said, it says that in Chazal, the Midrash says that Yitro tried out every religion and every Avodah Zara that was, that was available in his days. He tried them all out. And then he came to the conclusion that Judaism is the right way. So he brought back the enthusiasm, the, the fire of, of the Munah, of worshiping Hashem with all your might because he proved that there's nothing like Judaism. By right? trying them all out and deciding that Judaism is the right way. So that's, that's the idea of Gerei HaTzedek in our partial, in, in our bracha also, that <coughs> the Gerei sometimes make us more excited over Torah mitzvahs because they show us that they've tried other things and they come, they, they're coming from the outside and yet they decided to cling to Am Yisrael to connect to us and to believe the way we do in Hashem and in Torah Mitzvahs. So that brings back enthusiasm to our uh, worshiping of Hashem. It's always exciting to see a Ger Tzedek, uh, to hear the background of where they came from and how they made it to the Jewish people. It's always exciting. When they're not so Tzedek, it's less uh, pleasing to us, less comfortable for us uh, to accept. But uh, we won't go into that now. Uh, Halakhically, it's okay, but uh, it's not that same excitement that we have when we see a person who's very strong and devoted to Torah mitzvahs so when they came from the outside to hear all their background and see how excited they are about Judaism. So it makes us more excited, uh, even though we're naturally, uh, we're Jews naturally. Uh, we need that. Sometimes we need that extra uh uh, uh, extra push, motivation. motivation, right? What's that? For granted, exactly, exactly. Sometimes it's uh, because they're very mellowed. Uh, yeah, with that, with that, that extra motivation, right? Ah, so then I just uh, so this is uh, Rabbi Rosenblum uh, explaining this. So I just added one point to this that historically. Later on, way after Yitro and, and, and the Jews in the desert, we find the second milchama, the second war against Amalek in the days of Shaul. Shaul got rid of the Amalekim except for one, and because of that, he, that was his sin that he lost his kingdomship for. He left Agag, the king, but he, got, he, he 
destroyed and killed all the rest of the Amalekim. So uh, it says there right before the war that Shaul was about to battle against, uh, against Amalek. It says that he sent letters to the Kaini. Kaini was a people who lived in Canaan of those days, not the Canaani. Kaini, Kuf Yud, Nun Yud, had nothing to do with the Canaani. They weren't one of the seven nations that we were uh, commanded to destroy, to demolish. Uh, they were actually the descendants of Itro. Right, that's what the, the Gemara says, that they're descendants of Itro. So he sends them letters to say, I'm about to fight a war, to start a war against Amalek. And they were living nearby or, or, or amongst Amalek in the, in the area, in the location geographically in Israel, in the land of Canaan. So he, he tells them, go away, leave your homes find somewhere else to be for, for a short while because I'm about to start a war against Amalek. So we see here again that Yitro and Amalek <clears throat> are like balanced uh, uh, one, one, one against the other. Same as Yitro, their forefather, their uh, uh, ancestor uh, at the time of Amalek, he was the one that came and joined Ab Israel and proved against Amalek against the fact that they denied the existence of Hashem in Torah mitzvahs, he felt that uh, it's all true, it's all correct. So he came and joined Ab Yisrael, <clears throat> and he was thrilled about it, and he made us even stronger, uh, gave us the strength of Imuna. Same works the other way around. When we battle against Amalek, we make sure to save Yitro's descendants, because they're the good ones. Good versus bad, so we have that. Always, we're always uh, juggling between the two. So uh, uh, this is an odd way of. This is a beautiful way to see the gayrim as as uh, as a, it's a positive addition to our nation. Okay, then we said that We said last week that uh, still ascending upwards, the highest level, the highest. Uh, 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 performance of Torah mitzvahs and observance of Torah mitzvahs is when it's done publicly by all, no matter how many tzaddikim and chassidim and zkenim and sofrim and gerim there are, those are only individuals who are at a very high level. But there's nothing like the masses, the collective uh, concept in Judaism is something very huge and tremendous, and that's much more. Uh, holy than any individual, no matter how holy they are. That's why we can have nine men who are the holiest of holy and the righteous of righteous, and they will not make a, they will not be a minion. They cannot make a minion being only nine. I mean, Shechina doesn't dwell amongst nine men, but if we have ten, no matter how simple to how simple they are, a simple nine men who just say to heal him all day. Uh, they don't have any uh, any any level that they've that they've uh, uh, climbed uh, climbed to in their lives. They remain simple all their lives. But ten men make a minion, and there's shechina there, and there's holiness there, and there's kedusha and everything else. So we see that um, the number, the the the, the masses, the the, the uh, the uh, it's the amount that counts uh, if it's a, if it's a if it's a proper amount of, of, of Jews collected together and not the individual level of this or that. Okay, let's continue on a little bit further in this bracha. So what are we asking about for? The tzaddikim and chassidim and zkenim and sofrim and gerim and us and all the collective. What are we asking for? Yeah, that you should have mercy over us. Yemu yeah, is to yearn for, to be, uh, to be, uh, uh, with so much love and tender and care for us or for the tzaddikim and chassidim, with all Hashem's. Which all, all, all of Hashem's mercifulness. Hashem Elokeinu, Hashem, as we said, is the 
Midas Arachamim, Yud Kei Vav Kei, and Elokeinu that supervises over us specifically, over Ab Yisrael specifically, and leads our life, leads our leads the way for us. Veten Sachar Tov lechol abotchim b'shimcha be'emes. Now this is very interesting. We ask, we're asking for a, of Hashem to reward us, to reward us for what? For believing in Him and relying on Him. Botchim b'shimcha be'emet. Those who truly believe in Hashem. So we're now a little bit. Uh, we're now uh, limiting the bracha as to who it's meant for. Before we said, Tadikim, Hasidim, Iskadim, Sofrim, Gerim, and Aleinu, and all of us, which would actually mean all Jews. But now we're limiting it that those who are both Chibeshim, Chabeemet. Sometimes we know people uh, lead a religious life, technically speaking. But in their heart, it's hard to say that they trust Hashem and believe in Him thoroughly and totally. Because they're doing the actions, but not so much believing in their heart that everything depends on Hashem completely. For example, uh, the Rishonim speak about the idea of bitachon versus hishtadlut. On one hand, we rely on Hashem and we say that all that we trust Hashem for everything. And everything that happens to us or to anyone in the world is because of Hashem deciding it should happen. And there's no point in doing there, there, on one end, I'm saying, not, not saying this is the final idea, but on one end, one can think there's no point of doing anything alone. It already depends on Hashem. What Hashem decides should be, that would be. That's, that's what's going to be. So that's not true. We have the idea of Hishtadlut. Hashem tells us, I will bless you in all you do, what you must do. Or, uh, we say that Hashem ended the creation of this world and He created all that's in heaven and all that's on earth. And He created it in order to do. What does that mean? It should have said, Ve'asa. He created everything and, and, and did everything. La'asot is like in the future tense that should be done. The idea is that Hashem left room in this world for us to enhance the world and create more and more progress in this world. So we must fulfill this uh, 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 this term of la'asot. <clears throat> and it says to Adam Rishon, it says to Adam and Chava, bechiv shuha. Conquer the world, conquer the land, which doesn't mean defeat enemies because they were the only two human beings in the world then. So what does it mean, bechiv shuha? It means inquire, investigate, and do more and more to lead to progress in this world. As we continue to do, for thousands of years, and nowadays especially, there's so much progress. <clears throat> so on one hand, we have the Ishtadlu. But if someone thinks that their success is related to what they've done, that's totally wrong. We must do, but the one, who, the one and only who decides if we're successful or not, if we're able to develop in the way we, we, we believe we should be developing, and we're successful in what we do, it's only Hashem. Nothing to do with how much work and how much effort we put into anything. And sometimes people think that the more they work, the more they add hours and hours of work, that's how much they'll make. That's how large their salary will be. That's how, many, how much money they'll make. That's not true. Hashem has it all set and prepared for each one of us in the beginning of the year. Rosh doesn't matter how much you work. If you work a very tiny amount uh, and you expect to have a large salary, that's ain't some less. That's like to rely on a miracle. That doesn't work. But if you do normal hours of work, eight hours a day, that's normal. And then uh, the rest of the day, you learn Torah 
the rest of the day you do chesed, the rest of the day you're with the family. You're not crazy about work and filling in every moment possible to do more and more and more. So that, that proves that you're a botech b'shimcha be'emet. You're relying on Hashem truthfully, sincerely. You know that all is all you make, all you earn, or in any, uh, uh, in any area of life that you're involved in, any accomplishment, any success is all dependent on Hashem, nothing to do with us. As uh, the, uh, I believe it's Chobot El Mavot, Rabbeinu Bechai, who says, to believe and rely on Hashem, that's the emet. And charitzut sheker, the fact that you're a hard worker, it's very good to be a hard worker, but not necessarily fill up all your hours in your occupation. You could do your work and then leave two or three hours a day. That's a lot. But even if you have one hour a day, Leave out some time for learning Torah. That's part of the chalitzu. That's part of being diligent and, 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 and fulfilled person. But a person who believes that the more work they put into their job, the more they'll earn, that's totally shekel. That's wrong. Not true. Uh, but that's a big, it's a big trial for many of us to really believe in Hashem that, in that way. Sometimes we, we say it like a lip service, say, yes, we believe in Hashem, and Hashem does everything, Hashem controls everything, but the way we act is completely out of balance, completely uh, different than the way we express our belief. It really means that we don't believe in Hashem. The Hafez Chaim has a mashal, has a parable about this, uh, which is difficult for us really to accept, but that's that's the truth of the matter. Chavitz Chaim says that a person who pushes hard at work and works extra hours and you know, believes that his success and his salary will be based on how much hours he puts in. So the Chavitz Chaim says it's like a person in the train. He's in the train. The train is going a certain speed. And he looks at his watch and he fig- figures out that he'll be late for a meeting but with the pace the the train is going by, it'll be late for a meeting. So he goes to the beginning of to the uh, enter, to the beginning of the of the caron, the, the the car, right? So no, the car he is in. He goes to the beginning of it and starts pushing. So they can go quicker. That of course doesn't work. So the Chafetz Chaim says that's how that's the parable. If you think of it. Uh, that's what it really is. We think the more work we do, the more hours we put into it, that's how much we'll be successful, that's how much we'll earn. It's like pushing the car to make, to make it go quicker. Uh, the amount of money we'll earn is already set up the day one of every year, and we can't make any more than that. And if we think we'll make more by adding more hours of work, then it's going to be, if it's truly... Uh, what we're supposed to make. We'll make it anyhow, even in eight hours of work. And if we're not supposed to make that much, then we'll lose the money for something else. We'll have our car uh, uh, problems with our car. We have to fix it or buy a new one. Or we'll have uh, uh, all kinds of parking uh, uh, penalties uh, on the way during the year. So we'll be losing the money in other ways. We won't make any more money uh, by working uh, more hours. So... And this, by the way, have, is true for many, many areas of life, not only work and, and, and earning. It's also true, for example, by medicine or, uh, or security. All these things, uh, we do what we can to, be, to go to doctors and to be treated by doctors. We don't uh, believe in miracles and we don't rely on miracles. That we don't go to any doctor, we're sure everything's really okay because we said to healing. That's definitely not the right way to go about it. <laughs> but on the other hand, uh, to be overly dependent and feel it all has to do with the doctors, it all has to do with the science, it all has to do with what they know, that's also wrong. There's room for a doctor to treat us, 
but there's also room for Hashem to decide whether it will be healed or not, whether it's going to be successful or not. So we always have to have that in mind and truly believe that, it all, that, that the doctor is only a shaliach to serve, uh, to help us. He's the only message of Hashem, uh, an agent of Hashem to bring us uh, the cure that Hashem decided that it should be cured with. And if not, then no matter how brilliant the doctor is, and no, no matter how professional he is, it's not going to help. So it's something that we have to really make sure that we have that in mind very strongly. And that's, where it's, that's why it says, The word be'emet is, sticks out. Not just do we, we have lip service to us, yes, we rely on Hashem, we trust Hashem, we believe in Hashem, everything is from Hashem. We say that many times every day. But do we really believe that? That one can check, inspect themselves to see if they lead a life that has that that that, that proves that we rely on Hashem Be'emet and we leave time and effort to be part of the mitzvahs, part of the Torah, part of tefillah, and not just physically do everything to the utmost uh, possible way we can. And the very last message on this, uh, on this line, since when do we ask, you know, this may take time, so I'll just throw, out the, I'll throw, throw the question to you and we'll do the answer next week, keep you in suspense. Since when do we ask the ten sahar tov? It's very convenient and, 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 and pleasing to receive reward, good reward from Hashem for what we do. But are we supposed to be on a level, especially if Hashem Nesit Gedola established these words for Shfilat Shmoneh, we're standing right in front of Hashem, are we supposed to speak about the level that we hope to strive and reach of not worshiping Hashem for Sachar? We have that first famous, not first, second, don't be like servants or slaves that uh, work for their master in order to receive reward, to receive uh, uh, gifts or salary. Worship Hashem, Nishma, because we know that's the right way. So how come we speak of it's as if we're dependent. We say we only believe in Hashem, we only trust Hashem if He gives us reward for what we do. It's when, uh, is that a level that we're supposed to express towards Hashem when He's standing right in front of us? If you're good to us, we believe in you. That's what it sounds like. Ten sahar tov, and then we'll believe in you. Very awkward, very weird that this should be the, the, the speech to speak right in front of Hashem, directly to his face, so to speak. In Shmones, when he's right in front of us and within our four hours, within two meters, speaking to him directly, and we say, give us what we deserve. And then, then we'll line you, what's going on? So we'll keep that for next week. Uh, Get the answer for that. Anyone can think of uh, you can think of your own ideas uh, during the week, or look up. If you can find. Uh, I found one answer. It's not so simple to answer this question. It's a very powerful question, but uh, hopefully we're able to find uh, some answers. Okay, um, for brachos, we're at the very very end of this chapter of the Kavit Afel. We've got, yeah, I know, I know. But uh, every week we had so many other things to discuss. So I hope uh, this week we'll actually finish the chapter. Uh... <laughs> right, no, no, for sure not. For sure not. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so uh, one of the last discussions in this chapter is Tafel le Tafel. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so next uh, 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 situation we'll talk about is tafel tafel. What would happen? Till we spoke, we spoke about ikal tafel. 
you have the main food, the, the, the more important food for you, and the secondary one, it's just, it's just there to add some flavor. It's, you always say the bracha over the secondary one with all the details we've spoken about. What would happen if you have the main food, you have the secondary, but then that secondary food, you would like to have another food that's secondary to that secondary food. How does that work? How does it go for that line, right? For example, what's that? No, no, that's already you count with the fan. Another you count with the fan. We're talking about a sequence of three levels down. No, so that's like two. Right, it's still. Yeah, you have two tafels to one ikau. Not talking about that. I'm talking about ikau with the fail, and then tafel to a tafel. So let's see. Uh, we'll see how that works. Let's say, I'll give you the example of several examples. Let's say you have wine. You're drinking wine for a pregafe. You have now another drink, any other drink that you have, you don't say a brach over because any other drink is tafel. So Bray Priyagafin, Bray takes care of all beverages. So you drank wine. Now you have tea. You want to have some tea, which is, a, which is bitter. You don't have sugar. So the tea is to fail to the wine. You don't say charcoal because you say Bray Priyagafin. But because the tea is bitter, you would like to have some sweet, uh, like a date, let's say a sweet date to suck on or to chew as you're having the tea, or even after every, or after drinking half the cup of tea, it's so bitter in your mouth, you want something sweet. Not a cookie, because we said that a cookie, even if it's the fail, Mizonos never gets nullified. It doesn't override everything, but a, a Mizonos always has to be said, even if it's in a tafel situation, in a secondary situation. But let's say you're having a date to sweeten your palate because it's bitter from that tea, you do not say bray priya etz. How come? Because the wine is the ikal, the tea is tafel. We didn't say shakal over the tea because it's secondary to the wine because bray priya gafen overrides all other, takes care of all other beverages. Now, the only reason you're eating the date is just because you have a, a bitter taste in your mouth. You want to get rid of it by having something sweet. You don't really want to eat a date. That's the case. If you really don't want that date or a piece of chocolate, you want to put a piece of chocolate in your mouth? <laughs> you want just to sweeten your palate. Or you know what? You have those sugar uh, uh, cubicles. They used to have those with our grandmothers. Okay, that cubes. Makes more, that cubes. makes more sense to me than sugar than cubes. Because the sugar cube, you're really just eating for the sweetness. Right. Okay, but uh, I, I understand that point, but some people just want that date in this circumstance, not always when they eat dates, it's like that way. In this circumstance, they have no sugar cubes, like a sugar cube, after drinking bitter, bitter tasting uh, tea, you take a sugar cube, that should be a separate shackle, and that's not nullified to the wine, because it's a solid food, so very proud does not take care of a solid food, only beverages. So, yeah. 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 Right. Serious? Yeah. Ah, to clear, to take away the taste. Aha. Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah, so that's a that's and a that's a great case of. Uh, I mean, you do one after each one. No, and they say and this kind of chocolate has this kind of price right. because it's gonna uh, goes with this wine. Ah, uh -huh, this wine, wow, wow, wow! It's so, so accurate and exact about the, the types of chocolate. Like yeah, that's a good. <laughs> that's a great case of. No, so if you. <laughs> If you take more chocolate than what's necessary for this, uh, we're talking about a winery. Uh-huh. 
really like five you squares of like different chocolates. Right. So that's a case of tafel of a, directly, meaning if the wine is, we're talking about it, just uh, uh, repeat the question here for the Zoom ladies. If you have a, I'll just repeat the question first. In a winery, they serve square, small squares of chocolate to have after each taste of wine in order to, that, that, that shows the, uh, it gives the different taste to the wine afterwards or before as, as you taste the wine. So that's definitely a, a situation of tafel. You're not really eating chocolate in order to enjoy the chocolate. You're eating chocolate to taste the wine in different ways, in various different ways. So it's all meant to be part of the wine. But, but, um, it's interesting your case here now. Because we said in general, the rule of Mikavet Tafel, except for one exception for this, is that you're reading it together. It's combined. Never do we decide, do we say that there's a Mikavet Tafel eating one after the other, except for a b- very bitter taste or salty taste or sharp taste in your mouth, that even if you eat something after you ate the ikar, it's still tafel, it's still secondary, and you still don't say a bracha, because the only reason you're eating it is to get rid of that taste in your mouth that's not uh, pleasing to you. So here I would say this is the same idea. It's a good point. Exactly. The only reason you're eating is to change the taste of your in your palate to get ready for the next serving of wine uh, or feel the difference between them. So you're not really having chocolate to enjoy the chocolate. You're having it in order to change the taste in your mouth for something else. So it's exactly like the bitter taste and the sharp taste and the salty taste in your mouth you want to get rid of. Or sometimes too much sweet is also, you want to get rid of that sweet taste in your mouth. So that's the only case of the Kavit Afel that we consider the food you're eating as secondary and no need for a bracha, be, even though you're not eating it together with the ikar. So that's a true case of no bracha over the chocolate. Yeah, you would not say shahakal over that chocolate. Unless you eat more chocolate than Right, right. If you uh, sneak in some more squares. No, uh, no, no. They give you the square until you're the next bite. You don't need Ah, you get one square, but you can eat only a chip off of it. Aha. Uh-huh. But you could finish the whole square. But if you finish the whole square, then you say that proves that you're really eating for the sake of eating chocolate and not just for the sake of changing. You're right. Then you should say shackle, right? Because that proves that you now are interested in eating chocolate, you're not just changing the taste of your mouth. Right. That's a good point. But now that we added that the fill at the fill also gets nullified. So if you add the wine, and then some bitter tasting tea, which you did not say shackle over because the wine took care of the tea. And now since it was bitter tasting, you had a piece of chocolate or a date to get rid of that bitter taste in your mouth, you still don't say eights over that date or shackle over that chocolate because it's all nullified to the wine, being that the tea was nullified to the wine and the date is nullified to the tea. So it's all in sequence, uh, no bracha over the entire root. Of, uh, of of eating. Another case, another example of such a case of tafel et tafel, it doesn't get a bracha, doesn't deserve a bracha of its own. Let's say if you're having, um, in the middle of a bread meal, you're having a bread meal, and now you're, you, you take some schnapps, uh, whiskey. So if it's in the middle of the meal, like after the fish or something, no bracha required. Uh, it's part of the bread meal. It's part of the meal. Same as any other drink is not, except for wine or grape juice. We do say its own, we do say its own bracha of bread paragraph within a bread meal. But whiskey is shahakal. So shahakal gets nullified to the bread and it's considered part of the meal because that's how we eat. That's how we're used to eating and drinking during the meal. If it's, by the way, at the very end of the meal that you want to have some whiskey, then you would need to say a bracha shahakal even within a bread meal because it's already... It's like a dessert, right? Like a dessert. It's like it's on its own already and not part of the meal. But if you're having it in the middle of the meal, you don't say shackle. But let's say you had that whiskey. It was so sharp in your mouth, you need something to uh, ease it down, to, to something sweet or something to... Now, usually we, all, we, all, we anyway won't say a, wouldn't say a bracha over any food because we're eating a bread meal. 
So it's all nullified to the bread. So why are we talking about nullified to the secondary food? It's nullified to the bread. But let's say you take a fruit. You want to have a fruit to balance the sharp taste you have, the, 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 the sharpness of, of the whiskey you just had. It was too much for you. So you want to take a sweet fruit in order to balance out the, 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 the sharpness of the, of the whiskey. So you, normally, you would say bread priya et over fruit you eat, even during a bread meal, because fruit is not considered part of a, part of a meal, unless it's a combined in a salad or part of, a, uh, part of the chicken uh, gravy or whatever. But if it's completely a, a slices of fruit or, or whole fruit that you're having within a bread meal, you would need to say bread priya et if it would just come as a as you're liking to eat fruit. But if it's only to get rid of the sharpness of the whiskey, so then you don't say bread prints over the, over the fruit you're eating. So within a bread meal, you have this, this whiskey, then you're having the fruit to balance the taste in your mouth, you do not say bread prints because it's tafel et tafel. That's the idea. That's another example. Um, And one more, we'll, we'll discuss one more example. We get the, I think we got the idea. We'll get what we'll, we'll mention one more example. If let's say you're having, not within a bread meal, just regularly uh, during the day on its own. If you have something very sweet, you tasted something that's too sweet in your mouth, which is sometimes, which is not possible for Americans, it's not too sweet, but uh, uh, some feel sometimes. <laughs> No, because for Americans, they're all there. The whole uh, kitchen is always uh, done with sweet, uh, they sweeten their food, food a lot. So, but you're having something too sweet. So, again, you want to balance that taste in your palate to, to take away that sweetness in your mouth, which is not pleasing to you. So, you're going to have, so to balance it out, you want to have like a uh, salty food like a uh, herring, like a salty fish and stuff, to balance it out. So since you're just having it to balance out the sweetness, the extra sweet food you had, so there's no bracha over the herring, because you're eating it only to balance out the sweetness. I think this is very hard. This whole concept? You're taking something you like, but always when you're in the mood for a food, if, that, if I imagine that you're having something and I take something, I say, oh, because I'm having this, maybe I'll like this as a balance. That's the only reason? I wouldn't choose herring if I didn't like the taste of herring. I think it's hard to. Yeah. So far, the only one that's convinced me 100% is the sugar cube. There's no reason to eat that unless you just want something sweet. Uh -huh. But right. It's hard to say. You wouldn't choose a certain food if you didn't like it and enjoy to eat it. But the fact that you happen to want something salty now, how do you say is that the only reason I'm eating? It's a hard. No, I'll give you that. I understand your point. I'm not saying that uh, it's something you would never have on its own. But in the middle of the day, you haven't, you hadn't even, you had, it didn't cross your mind to have some uh, herring now. <clears throat> you have no interest in the middle of the day to have some herring. But you took a bite or ate something very sweet, and it's revolting. You don't, you don't like that taste in your, in your palate. You want to get rid of it. So you find something that's very salty. It wasn't at all in your mind to have herring now. Now, I agree that you, you, you may enjoy the herring, may like herring. It doesn't mean you don't have to, that you would never eat it alone or it would never be tasty for you. You're just eating it in order to balance the sweetness. But you had no interest whatsoever at this point of, of the day, midday, to have herring. What about the drink? But I didn't think I was going to have a drink. No, that's something else. So you're having a drink directly to quench your thirst. That's, that's definitely... A bracha. So, if you make something salty, okay. If you eat a cookie that's too sweet, you okay. get rid of the herring to get rid of that, but then you balance it. But then the herring was too salty, so you eat it. Exactly. Apple, you get rid of the salty from the herring. Exactly. Exactly. You don't make a bracha on the apple either. Exactly. That's the fellet of the Exactly. That's who we're talking about. Achal ma achal ma tok meod.
אכל דג מלוח, he can have a whole, a whole line up of foods. Without only one bracha to cover it. Exactly, exactly. That's what, that's what it means, exactly. But the idea is just having a small amount of each one or to balance the previous one, and not because you want to eat it. Salty. You ate something you didn't like, so you take a drink of some. That's often why. If it's if it's really, um, yeah. But being thirsty, no, it's a little different. I drank, so I have a bad taste in my mouth, so I'll drink some. Ah, fine. So the, the, exactly. So here, I'll give you another case. Uh, here, I'll give you another case. Uh, not not. That's not a fail at a fail. That's just. Want to fill? You eat, you eat something that's very bitter. Oh, now you want to drink water, water to get the water bitter. With a bottle of a, a hydrating drink because you just need to hydrate. You're not thirsty. Right. So that okay. You're talking about now. This isn't it's a fail at a fail. This is just right. You're just talking about the, the concept itself. <laughs> right. 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 So beforehand, beforehand. Uh, I'll just read to you exactly the halacha regarding something very bitter. trufa mara. Okay, you're drinking down, you're drinking a bitter, bitter tasting medicine. Shedido lo levarech. You don't say a bracha over bitter tasting medicine because it's out of food. So no bracha there. Not only when you swallow a pill, there's no bracha, also when you drink a medicinal uh, uh, liquid, which is very bitter, you don't say a bracha. Because you're not enjoying it. It's just uh, for medicine, for medical purposes, you're having it. And now, you, since it's bitter, you have the bitterness in your mouth, you want to drink some juice in order to get your palate more tasty, more pleasing. You say a bracha, you do not. So we would think, tafel, because we're drinking it, we're drinking this juice only because we have the bitter taste in our mouth. But tafel to what? It was nothing. There was no bracha. Over the medicine, so if we would, if if the idea of a kavit affair would mean that the food itself or the drink itself is nullified to the ikar, it wouldn't matter if the ikar has a bracha over it or it doesn't have a bracha over it. It's still nullified to the substance of the medicine that made you drink now something sweet and then you don't see a bracha over it. But that's not true. The kavit affair works that the bracha over the ikar covers the affair. It's not that the actual food itself gets nullified to the ikar, to the main food, or a significant food. So exactly. So only if you said a bracha over the ikar, do you then not have to say a bracha over the fel. But if there's no bracha over the ikar, like, i.e., this example of eating, of, drink, of, of drinking down a bitter tasting uh, medicine, which does not require a bracha, if it's, by the way, a sweet tasting medicine, uh, it depends. If it's like a sucking candy that's uh, for your throat, uh, uh, sore throat, you're taking a sucking candy that has medicinal uh, parts to it, but it's really tasty. It's like a honey tasting, tasting candy or lemon tasting candy. You do say a bracha. Even though your main goal, the main purpose of, of, of sucking that candy is for medicinal purposes, but it's a candy after all. It has good taste and you're sucking it. You do say a bracha, you do say shackle. So Zabin said that if it's a syrup that you have no interest whatsoever and it's good tasting, you do not say shackle, even if it's good tasting. Like uh, a kamoli for kids. They have a kamoli with different tastes to it. And sometimes they like it even. Uh, most of the time they don't like it even with those tastes. Uh, but sometimes they like the taste. So, so you don't say shackle because you're not really drinking. Is syrup you just gulp down and, and no, the good taste is just in order to let the kids take it. Otherwise, they won't they won't agree to take it. Do it. So that's not like a second candy, which is really acts like a candy for you. So sometimes you do say a bracha, sometimes you don't say a bracha over medicines that have good taste in them. But a bitter tasting medicine, never do we say a bracha over. And since there's no bracha over the ikha. So if we now have juice just in order to balance the bitter taste of the medicine, and really have no interest in drinking juice now, we do, we, we do have to say a bracha over it, because there's no bracha over the ikan. 
So then we do have to say shackle. That's an exception to the rule of tafel ve'ikar. Avikar ve'tafel. Even though it's tafel because we're just having it to balance, we do say a bracha over the juice because we did not say a bracha over the medicine. So the ikar always has to have a bracha over it in order to cover the tafel later on. Or tafel a tafel. All that we said before has to cover, be covered. Correct. We said that already. We don't. We don't see. Same thing. Same difference. If you're just taking that drink to swallow a pill, just the small amount, just to get down the pill in the throat, it doesn't matter if it's juice, even if it's grape juice, even if it's wine, it doesn't matter. The fact that you're drinking it down only, you're drinking it only to gulp down that, to help you gulp down that the, the pill, that already takes away the need for a bracha. Now, if you're having water to. The drop of water, because um, we said that, right, we said by a fast day, we're supposed to refrain from any drink or any food, no matter what the reason we're drinking it. We need to, uh, we're supposed to fast, not, not add any liquid, any fluid to our body or any food to our body. That, that's what it's yeah, meant. That's the problem. It shouldn't really count so, a piece to oh, so that's only because you're drinking less than the kishiu. That's something else. That doesn't mean it doesn't matter if it's in order to. Kishiu or every fasting? Yeah, every fasting. It can't be worse. It can't be that a simple fast is worse is is more stringent than Yom Kippur. So anything less than kishiu, you're not really breaking your fast. But we still hold right. But we still hold that. Best is that you don't drink anything because chazi shiur or so in the Torah. If it's a direct level, like a kipper, even if the shiur is a certain amount, and you're and for that amount, if someone drinks that amount, it's correct. So if you drink less than that, it's still this is the right that's just not correct. By a, by a rabbinic uh, uh, fast day, like all the rest, so. There's also the same amount like in Kippur that you mustn't drink. Half less than that amount is still breaking your fast, but it's not uh, to the point of, uh, of being uh, punished for it. So we don't drink anything, but the drinking there is just the fact that you're adding liquid to your body. It doesn't mean it doesn't have to be as an essential as the main drink you're having or, or something that requires a bracha. The mere fact that you're adding fluid normally by drinking down some water to you. To your body, that's considered uh, going against the fast. It's not breaking the fast because it's not kishiu, but you're not supposed to do even less than kishiu. So you know, not to, to refrain from any food or any drink whatsoever. So I was fasting and I needed medicine. I asked you if I could take a half a teaspoon of water with it. Is there any point in continuing to fast then? Of course. Of course. You continue to fast. Even if they broke the fast totally, let's say they had a half a cup of water, there's a it should continue fasting, yes. Because you still feel bad, you still feel diffic the difficulty of not eating and drinking the rest of the day, even if you drink a whole cup of water. So although you, you cannot say aneno anymore, in the Shmonesra, you can't say aneno because it's not beyond some time to you're not fasting. But to feel the difficulty together with Klali's trail, feel the difficulty that day, best to continue fasting. Yes, that's what they say. Just to have that difficult feeling. Same as they say when someone asks to break their fast for... What's that? No, no, no. It says ex explicitly <laughs> that you continue. Yeah, you don't gain anything by breaking your fast. You just, you just broke it. No, because kids shouldn't fast. So we're supposed to tell them eat and continue eating the whole day because they shouldn't fast. It's not good for their body. It's not healthy for them to fast. So Mazamid even held that the last three fasts, the last three fast days of a kid who's about to become 12 or 13, 12 for girls, 13 for boys, they should not fast either. Even the day, one day before turning 13 or 12, it is a Yom Kippur. The day before, they should not fast. He said it's very... He's very strong about it, that it's, it's bad for their health, and it's not 
It's not meant for them to fast. Their bodies are weaker. And so, even the day before, no fast. He said, just go a little bit further than breakfast time. Uh, they should eat only as of lunch, let's say. It's called the shout, that they feel some difficulty like all the rest of the Jews, uh, the grown-ups, uh, they fast. But not to fast a full day, yeah. Not that it works for us, because uh, the kids like, uh, little kids like to prove that they can fast a full day. They have contests between each other, how much they fasted each one uh, to a longer hour. So not that it works for us to provide, to, to uh, South of fasting, but uh, not supposed to. Anyhow, um, so the uh, question if you had before um, if one is not drinking in order to quench the thirst, but rather because they just need that, that liquid in their body to hydrate, um, I would think that still requires a bracha because it's not something that we can see as nullified to something. It's similar to this case of a case even when it is nullified because you've had uh, a bitter tasting medicine, but there was no bracha over it. So even though the water you're drinking or the juice you're drinking is in order to get rid of that taste in your mouth, you do need to say a bracha, even though it's a clear cut case of tafel because you didn't have a bracha over the ikar. So definitely if it's to hydrate, there's no other bracha to serve as an ikar to get rid of the bracha, to take away the bracha, the tafel. So even if it's considered tafel from the uh, 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 the way it's, the, 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 the reason you're drinking is, order, is, is not in order to quench your thirst, but only to, 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 to hydrate and fill yourself with some liquid, but really not just in drinking, but there's no bracha on anything ikar to, to, to serve as the bracha over the tafel. And we said that's the whole point of tafel. If there's already a bracha over something else that serves for the tafel. Here there's no bracha over anything else, so you need to say the bracha, even if it's tafel. So that's, that's a definite case. Okay. Um, now another very uh, uh, common situation. Uh, this is really, really it. Uh, uh, to finish the chapter. Uh, we have these types of almonds, chocolate, either chocolate-covered almonds, or sometimes they have those uh, sugar-coated almonds, like they're like candies. You know, those that were white or pink. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's no, what they're called? They're called Jordan almonds. With the coating. Right, the coating, like pink or white. Yeah. yeah, it's a hard candy. It's like a hard candy, right. <laughs> Sorry, like <laughs> yeah, I also like them so much. I haven't seen them around in many quite often, but uh, recently I haven't seen them around. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> ah, that's a thin layer, like a thin layer, very thin layer. Yeah, right. So that's definite a a, a thin layer of chocolate. Or sugar is definitely ha'etz, very pre You don't see shakol there. Because that's definitely nullified to the almond. The almond is the cow. You see, you want to make it a little tasty. That's a tasty almond, so you make it. To... But that's providing you're, you take a bite. As you're eating, you take bites of the almond together with the sugar coating or the chocolate coating. You're biting the, the whole thing together. Then you say only ha'etz. If you want to lick the chocolate or suck it uh, off of the almond or the sugar, then you need two brachot. Because even though it's tafel, even though it's secondary to the almond, but you eat them separately. You're licking you off. The... Yeah, but that, no one, you would lick off the chocolate? That's what you do? No, I, I know those uh, cookies that have like the sandwich cookie. And the cream in the in, in the middle, in between, yeah. like Oreo, like uh, chiyuchim. Oh yeah, oh the way it's like a wafer. Wow, that's very messy. <laughs> yeah, so you become full of chocolate. Uh huh. 
So yeah, right. Wait for sometimes you open them also and the, yeah. the child from the middle, right? Yeah. So that, that requires two brachos. The moment you take the secondary food, but you eat it alone, we said the only time we say one bracha over, over the kavit is uh, when you're not eating them together is when you, we just spoke about before, when you have some bad taste in your mouth and you want to get rid of it. That's even one after the other will be considered secondary. But or all the other situations, a or a bad taste, because right. Right. Because. Right, because of the taste, then, right, not necessarily bad, but also because of, then you don't say a bracha over tefel, but otherwise it has to be they're eating together. Anytime you're eating a kavit tefel separately, if it's not to get rid of a certain taste, you say two separate brachas. Now, the problem is you could ask the question, well, then it's bracha shina tzricha. If you're able to take one bite of the wafer or Oreo or a uh, chocolate-covered almond and say one bracha over them, so are we allowed to suck the chocolate off the, off the uh, almond or eat the cream within the cookie before we eat the actual cookie and then say shehako separately? The answer like is, that. oh, you like it that way. Exactly. You like it that, like that. Meaning, uh, any reason you have to do that, sometimes it's for health reasons that you prefer uh, uh, something to do, to eat something before. Let's say you're about to have a bread meal, bread meal, you, know, you wouldn't need to say bracha over anything. But for health reasons, you want to start with drink, a drink before you eat bread. Uh, your dietitian told you it's healthier to do it that way. So you can say shahakal over the drink, even though you're about to eat a bread meal. They would not, then after having the bread, you would not need to drink. So all these cases are, if you have a good reason to begin with the secondary food, you say a bracha over it, even though if you had, had it after the main food, you would not need to say. So that's all true for the uh, Oreo and almond and all that. If you suck the, or take, uh, or take, eat the, Secondary food first, you say a bracha over it. And if you have a reason to do so, like you like it that way, then you can do it that way. Even though if you had a bite, taking a bite, taking a bite from the whole food together, you would not need to say a bracha over the secondary food. So that's for that. The candy coated uh, almonds, those are the white ones and the, or the pink ones that are candy coated. Those have, that's already a large amount. That's a candy candy. It's not just, a, a thin layer over the almond. It's not? It's what? Which is? Ah, so that, it depends how much chocolate there is there. Is there. If it's a thick layer of chocolate, then you would need to say two brachos. Right. Then you need to say two brachos because here, you don't have to have it to fail. They're both important to you. So there we need two separate brachos. What? Right. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah? Wow. <laughs> All right, cracks in half, and then you can get the almond out? Uh-huh. Okay, but since it's a very thick layer, so that requires two separate brachos. Uh, ah, but even, that's not simple. He says here in the book that that's only if you're eating the candy part first. You're sucking, sucking, sucking over the candy. You finish that, and then you get to the almond. Then you say two separate brachos. Well, because it takes time. No, you need to take out the almond before you say the bread prayer adds over it. Yeah, why not? So really, it's one bracha. Same as you. So really, it's one bracha. Right, but usually that's how it's eaten. This type of food, that's how it's eaten. Um, but what, what do you do? When you get to the almond, what do you do then? Yeah, it's not as thick anymore. Ah. By, by, by sucking it. Uh -huh. So you still add, you're still combining. It's you still combined with the sugar of it? Okay, so if it's... Then it should be okay. Right, that is just shackled, right. If you're eating the whole thing together all the time, all the time until you finish the whole food, then it's only shahakal. Only if you suck the candy 
all the way down to the almond, and the almond is left alone, then you take it out of your mouth, you say, I ate, and you eat the almond. But if it's always combined together as you're eating it, and you're chewing it in the end with some candy on it, then it's only shakol for the whole thing. Okay, <laughs> so we finally finished uh, this chapter. Yeah, become it a fail, right? Is that up? Now, the, by the way, as of this chapter, the next chapter is Mishia Tzai Motzia Harim. We actually finished discussing all the different various types of foods. And now, as of the next chapter onwards, it's completely, it's still brachos, but it's uh, situations that uh, don't discuss the actual food, but discuss the people, the person, to be both the others and things of that sort. So, right. So it's going to be much less uh, complicated uh, from now on. The different uh, ways of saying the bracha, and different ways of and the people who are saying the bracha, it's not no longer on the food itself. So the complications uh, of, uh, of what we've done till now will not continue for the next chapters. So it'll be easier, uh, easier learning from now on. Okay, take care, everyone. Have a Continue a good week, good summer. Yes. Thank you very much. Very welcome. Bye bye.